Hello. Today we take the next step in our renormalization program. The idea now is to take a deeper look into renormalization and at the same time uh, get a better feeling, a better understanding of what renormalization is doing in quantum field theory and develop tools that will allow us to calculate these next to leading order and even higher effects, right? Loop effects in quantum field theory uh, in a way that we have better control over uh, some approximations we did before, right? Especially the question of large uh, logarithms that we didn't attack yet and we will eventually get to and try to solve, right? So we will start that, uh, that uh, uh, program by attacking first the Wilsonian renormalization group. Right? So that's the uh, view from Wilson of, of renormalization and the consequent uh, improvements uh, made by other people that allow uh, uh, that, that uh, allowed us to, to write these renormalization group equations right? in the Wilsonian uh, approach. In order to, to get a better feeling of what we're trying to do, let's take a look at what we did so far. Right? So we started from Lagrangians. Right? These Lagrangians are uh, our models. Right? Within quantum field theory, is it, it is in the Lagrangian that we do all the modeling. Right? We, we say what matter content is, we say what the symmetries are. Those two things together uh, limit uh, what kind of operators we can put in there. And of course, in front of each of these operators, there's a number, right? A coupling, a mass, right? Uh, which we will, in general, call the Wilson, co Wilson coefficients of these operators, but we'll get to that when needed, right? And, and these parameters, they, they can be related uh, to observables, but we have seen that that is not uh, straightforward, right? These, these parameters in the Lagrangian, these numbers that go in front of the operators are not really directly observable, right? And we have dealt uh, so far, last 20 videos, uh, on, on how uh, not trivial it is to compare them with experiments, right? In doing that, we have seen that at next or even higher, that's what this plus mean, n plus leading order, right? Can be next to next to leading order, even higher, right? Uh, these uh, loops that appear in, in quantum field theory will uh, give basically two kinds of effects, right? We had some finite parts in those loops, right? Which I could relate more straightforwardly to observable quantities. So we saw a few examples like in the lamp shift, which I could uh, calculate a, a change in the potential and, and see uh, how that uh, changed the, the, did the lamp shift, right? Also, we saw the G minus uh, two in the case of the electron, right? And of course, those observable quantities, right? Not, uh, allow us to connect these model parameters at a particular scale, right? They, they fix the value of some of the, these parameters in our Lagrangian, but only at the scale where uh, we're doing the experiment where, that we extra, uh, use to, to, to obtain these observables, right? Also, we have seen that those loops, right? They have in, uh, divergent parts, right? But uh, this is not really observable, right? What, what is observable is how uh, is the difference between these uh, infinities that showed up, right? And that, uh, once we frame that as a difference between the same quantity measured at different scales, the infinities go away, right? And you get a, a dependence on these external momenta, right? In, in some cases, it's just the scale of, of energy of in which you're doing the, the experiment. In other cases, you also had dependencies on the sensitivity of the detector, right? Just think soft collinear uh, divergences, for instance. They, they, they were telling us uh, that a, at a low energy, right? Even the, the direction of the external momenta is important because when a photon was collinear with the mu in the example we saw, that also uh, 
change the cross section in, in non-trivial ways, right? And and that's what we mean by these external momentum dependencies. Is is uh, beyond what you already had in leading order, right? Because a leading order, of course, sometimes you have a, a coupling at your Lagrangian with a derivative in it, and of course that interaction depends on the momentum. I also had momentum uh, dependency. Uh, on 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 external momenta coming from the phase space, right? When you calculate in a cross section, of course that depends on the external momentum, the external momenta. But but this is beyond, right? We we saw that once you include loops, there's uh, more dependencies on 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 external momenta that are important, right? Now. In doing that, we also needed to renormalize, regularize, you know, uh, our theories. And that introduced uh, also the dependence on some unphysical quantities, right? I, I wrote some of them here, right? Like uh, when you're uh, fixing your renormalization conditions, you have to say uh, some reference point, right? I'll, I'll equate my, my, my observable coupling with this thing that is in the Lagrangian at this scale in energy. Of course, the physics should be independent of that choice, right? Also, the cutoffs, the epsilon is here from dimensional regularization. This mu here could be in dimensional regularization, some scale that enter, uh, entered your uh, calculations or a subtraction point. You know, you have all these unphysical scales, right? that entered your calculation. And, and the thing is, these are not physical at all. They are only appearing because when I introduce that scale, I can change it. And my couplings and, and uh, masses have to change accordingly, right? If I'm changing one of these parameters, the couplings have to change in order to compensate that everywhere in the calculation and give me observable quantities that are independent of that. Right? Now, what we want to do is to exploit exactly that, uh, that relation between the, the external momentum dependencies, which are physical, right, observable, and these internal uh, dependencies on unphysical quantities, right? Because those two usually come together, right? Most, more often than not, even in the same logarithm, right? You have this, some logs, right? of uh, p squared external momentum over one of these things here, right? And that is, it is the distance that is important, but we know that the physics should not depend on the one on the bottom, right? And, and so, since they come together, maybe demanding that my observables are independent of this allow me to constrain how they, the, the observables can depend on the external things, right? This is the game we're about to play, and that's this, the essence be, behind what we call the renormalization group, right? We'll go into that in details, right? But the idea is to demand that some objects in my theory are independent of these, right? And by doing that, put uh, uh, constraints on how they can depend on this, right, and extract the physical, uh, the physical uh, content of the theory by doing that, right? So that's the idea. So the first example of a renormalization group we'll see is the Wilsonian one, and Wilson uh, derived his inspiration from uh, condensed matter, right? He was moving between high energy physics and condensed matter, and he realized that. In the case of uh, condensed matter, there was really a physical cutoff uh, to any field theory you could work with, right? So uh, just think any any condensed matter system that you like, right? Water, uh, 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 magnet, you name it, right? We know that those are made from molecules and atoms, right? So your continuous description of the system in terms of density, temperatures, uh, viscosity, uh, I don't know, magnetization. If you go too close to the, the scale of, uh, of molecules, that breaks down because you start to see 
the discreteness of the system and the, the, all the complicated interactions between these uh, small objects that make up this this uh, this um, material, right? So, in that case, the the cutoff is physical, okay? and and let's take inspiration from that. So the idea here is that I have some system made from I don't know these small dots, right? And or whatever the property is, you can think of uh, I don't know. There each to each of those dots has a spin that can be oriented up and down only. Right or you know some density, some number, right? That I can average over uh, small regions here and associate a scalar field to it. That's the simplest thing we can think of, right? It's just a, a, a material that is characterized at each point by one number, a real number, and that we'll call phi. And of course, there's a position uh, in here. I'm just taking a two-dimensional space, but could put three dimensions or one dimension, it doesn't matter too much for, for our purposes here, right? But I can associate a field with that, right? Which is, is this map right here. I can map this material into this field, which is a field uh, living in two uh, space dimensions, right? We know that this breaks down if I look too close, right? There is a intrinsic spacing of this uh, lattice, right, which I call A, right? And if we, if we go too close, there's a scale, right, which is a scale of momentum, which is one over A in natural units, right? Uh, where I cannot uh, talk about a field anymore, right? In terms of the momentum, right, you could take a phi of K, right, uh, which are Fourier, uh, components of this field, right? Makes no sense to talk about momenta higher than this lambda because you cannot just describe oscillations of this field between those points. So this introduces a physical cutoff to these theories. Now let's think a little bit and what we're doing when we step from here, right? The UV of these theories where you see the discreteness towards this description, which I assume is really far away from that one, right? The scale in which we, we use these uh, continuous descriptions is uh, many orders of magnitude below this momentum scale or uh, bigger than A in terms of uh, distances, right? So let's think a little bit about this, uh, uh, this uh, path we take here. Right. What you're doing, let me bring a lattice here that we'll use, this one, right? You could start from a discrete description, right? In this case, I'm just saying, say, suppose it is the spin, right? They, I could uh, make a lattice, right? So I have this phi of ij, and to each of those points, I can say the spin is up or down. This could be plus or minus, one minus one, one or zero, you name it, right? I can just do a discrete description of these, and then I have this spacing, right? When I do that, I have to write uh, some, uh, give some dynamics to, to, this, to this discrete theory, right? Which could be described like that in terms of these uh, degrees of freedom, these phi's of ij, right? And of course, amongst uh, other things, right? I could associate a kinetic energy with everything and, and decide on the interaction. So I could have, for instance, some kind of interaction between neighbors here. I could sum over ij, right, uh, and, and do some, uh, some interaction. It could take any form I wanted. It would be dictated by uh, symmetry and, and, and all of that, right? This is really arbitrary. I'm just putting anything here. This uh, would mean they only interact vertically, but it's it's just any example, right? The important point I want to make is how do I move from this description towards that one, right? If eventually, I have to do something like taking averages, right? I, I just look at a small region, let's say I choose like a, uh, a small grouping here, say of four of these dots, right? And I take some average and associate that with 
uh, a new point, right? A new coordinate which represents this group. And I'm doing the same for this one, this one, and this one, right? And I'll define a new field that describes, right? I'll, I'll, I'll create a phi prime, let's say, that gives me the same uh, quantity I was calculating before for each dot, but now average, for instance. There are many ways of doing that. I could just impose that the, the, the number for the group is the number for the top left guy. I could take an average. I could do more complicated stuff. The important thing is now I am associating this quantity to a group instead of just one of these components, right? This procedure is what we call coarse uh, graining, right? And makes this transition from one phi here to this new phi prime, which describes the system at a, 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 a bigger scale in terms of distances, right? Because now the distance between these, these new points is 2a as compared with before. So I'm looking from farther and farther away, right? If I keep doing that again and again, right? And the point uh, we, we should notice, right, is one, I have a new uh, dynamic for the system. Let's call that Li prime of phi prime, this new uh, mapping, right? Still discrete in this case, right? And there's no reason. Now I also have this interaction between neighbors, right? But there's no reason for uh, neighbors to interact with the same strength they they interacted here, right? Could be weaker, uh, it could be stronger, but we don't know. It's, it's What we can say for sure is that in general, it won't be the same. You could find some system where it is exactly the same, but most systems won't have that property, right? So my new lambda here is, is different from the lambda at that scale, right? Another thing is that we changed the cutoff, right? There's a lambda prime now for this new variable, which is 1 over 2a, right? Now imagine I do that again and again, right? So now I associate, I take the same procedure, right? Take four points here, associate, it and associate a new one, the yellow one in this case, to each of these groupings here, and I do my coarse graining again, right? And I go to even another field, let's call it phi prime prime, right? And again, I have a new coupling for these new uh, groupings, and I even lower cutoff because I'm uh, going farther and farther away from these, uh, um, UV description, right? The microscopic description. The important thing I want to call to attention here is that is the implicit dependence of these guys, right? As I'm changing the cutoff for my theory, right? I'm, I'm writing it in terms of, uh, of uh, variables that describe only higher and higher scale effects, right? I hear in term higher means longer distance scales, right? Uh, I have to change my couplings too, right? In order to, to, to take into consideration that I'm not talking about the same objects, right? And the key point here is that when I'm doing that, I'm throwing away all the little details that could be happening here. Every time I, I do an average like that, or just take a, a one uh, of these numbers, I'm, I'm throwing away the details, right? And, and going towards uh, theories that are valid uh, without, where those details do not matter, right? The microscopic details don't matter. And in terms of momentum, right? The way you could think about this is the following, right? You could think, well, I have these, uh, now I'm trying to very hand wavily see how that would work with a quantum field theory, right? So you think I have some field which I'm describing now in momentum space, right? For which uh, 
I only taking uh, Fourier modes that actually fit here. So modulus of k should be smaller than lambda, right? And uh, I have some some action action for the path integral. Notice here that I'm already limiting myself to to Euclidean space because that comparison is less ambiguous in Euclidean space. Uh, so let's simplify our life and focus on the simplest case, right? That's why also we are using only a scalar, a real scalar field. Right? Now I can divide this path integration in two parts, right? One, which is this phi prime here that is limited to a lower cutoff, right? And a second part that allows momenta to go between the two cutoffs. Right? And in principle, while not technically easy to do, I could integrate on this, make only this integral, right? The resulting part I could exponentiate, put here, right? And get some other action that is now effectively the action of the system, right? But with this new cutoff, right? And of course, in here, once I, I took the result of this integration and move it back into the action, the couplings, the masses, the operators here might have changed. Right? So I have a new Lagrangian, right? a new action, which is different from the starting one, but now valid only up to this uh, lower cutoff. Right? So the main assumption that will base everything we do from this point on, that, so that's very important, and it is the assumption of, uh, that Wilson made, right? is that if I go too far away from this scale A here, so I increase the scale I'm looking the system, and that means I lower the highest momenta allowed, right? I'm going away from that microscopic system towards macroscopic descriptions, right? The exact distance A shouldn't matter. And that's the point, right? You never saw any engineer trying to solve, I don't know, aerospace problems uh, and, and having to take into consideration the spacing between uh, aluminum uh, atoms in the alloy he's, he's making, right? He's, he's doing everything in terms of this materials uh, description. And so if I change a little bit A, or in other words, if I change my cutoff, and I'm really far away from that cutoff, the low energy description shouldn't depend on the exact value of the cutoff, right? The Lagrangian will, right? As we have seen here, right? Uh, uh, my, my couplings in the Lagrangian will get a dependency on this cutoff. We have seen this happening when we did Polyvillar's uh, regularization. But the low energy description shouldn't. So I can impose that my observables are independent of the cutoff, right? And that will get me some differential equations which are really important, right? So that's the, the essence of what we're going to do now. Uh, but we'll take a while to get there. But keep in mind that this is a very, is a very, uh, intuitive uh, assumption, right? But be very powerful one, demanding that this cutoff, even if it is a physical cutoff, shouldn't matter too much for lower low energy uh, measurements, right? Makes this the internal parameter that I was talking before, right? It makes this the parameter that uh, nothing sh nothing relevant uh, phenomenologically should depend on right? and we will use that fact in what follows right? so let's try to make this uh, more formal right we want to to
to implement the coarse graining uh, procedure in quantum field theory in a formal way. Right? And that's what we call momentum shell integration. Right? So we know that in quantum field theories, everything is containing really in this generating function, or Z, right? which we have defined by some normalization times the path integral of the exponential of the action plus sources, right? The sources won't be important for us here. Pretty soon I'll just forget the sources and bring them back when I need them, right? Now we want to, to use these, right? Normally we have these fields. Uh, the path integration is in, in uh, position, right? But we want to write these uh, in terms of phi tilde, right? I won't be carrying the tilde around, but now we're really defining this path integral in terms of a, a product of uh, integrals of phi of k, right? So this is the momentum, uh, the Fourier modes of, of the field, right? Of course, same exponential. Why we want to do that? Because we want to implement a cutoff at the level of the path integ of, uh, integral, right? And, and that means that my phi of k will only be defined for some module of k smaller or equal than the cutoff, which I'm assuming to be physical. So now I'm saying my quantum field theory is not really UV complete, is one way of saying it. It's not valid to arbitrarily large uh, values of this momentum, right? So that's important conceptually. What we're doing here is different from the assumption we had uh, before, right? And for k, of course, for k bigger than lambda, I could say that uh, phi of k is zero, right? So I'm, I'm either just summing up in, on my path integral a bunch of zeros or not, not even considering any uh, Fourier mod at all beyond that. The notation I use to indicate that will be something like that. So instead of just putting uh, the integration measure uh, like this, I'll just write lambda and that's what it means. It means that now my product of uh, in, uh, integration in, in, in phi k's is only considering k smaller than lambda. Right, so this is this is uh, our our integration measure now. Huh? Now, in, to be concrete, we want to choose some uh, theory, right? Some Lagrangian, and we will use, of course, our favorite uh, theory when we need to be to keep it simple, right? When the effects are already ap applying in lambda phi four, there's no reason to go beyond lambda phi four. Right? If that is good enough to see what we want to see, that's what we are going to use. So our z now will be just the integral in this integration uh, measure of the exponential of minus dx4, d4x, right? Half del mu phi square plus half of m0 let me put that in in a different color i will specify what i mean by m0 now m0 square phi square plus lambda 0 over 4 factorial phi to the fourth since I'm doing that from the start, it's very tempting to, to rush into identifying these guys with the bare constants, right? The bare mass, the bare coupling uh, that uh, appeared before, right? But keep in mind that this theory is UV finite, is only valid up to some uh, cutoff. I have to be careful that my lambdas are actually uh, uppercase. And, and, and so, don't rush into that identification. We'll, we'll get to that eventually, right? But don't think of these guys as inf 
in finite quantities yet, right? We'll see what are the conditions in which these guys really coincide with the bare masses or not. Right? Now the zero just means before I start doing tricky stuff with this Lagrangian, right? So again, I'm, I'm staying the Euclidean, right? And now what I want to do is the coarse graining, right? I want to lower my cutoff. So just let's draw a line here for this uh, absolute value of momentum. So far, my theory is valid up to here from very small momentum up to lambda, right? Now I want to introduce a lower cutoff, which I'll call B lambda for convenience. So just we not carrying lambda prime, lambda prime prime, you know, right? B is just any number smaller than one, right? Between one and zero. So this scale is smaller than this one, right? And I have a new uh, scale here. Now, I will exchange this field phi here by other two fields, which I'm calling phi, same name as before, just to confuse you, but this is, this is not the same phi as before, right? And some phi hat of k that lives in this distance, right? What do I mean by lives here or lives there? The, the exact definition is this. I will exchange my original phi of k for these two fields, which I have defined as phi hat and this new phi of k. And they are themselves defined in, in this way, right? So this guy is defined as the same as the original one for, actually not the same, phi hat for b lambda smaller or equal k, which is smaller than lambda, right? And the new, and it's zero, right? Outside though that range, b lambda or, or k, bigger than lambda, right? K smaller than B lambda or K bigger than, than lambda. The other guy is uh, complementary, right? So these will be phi of K below that point, the new cutoff, right? And zero everywhere else. Okay, bigger or equal to B lambda. So what I'm doing here, right, is this is the high energy uh, degrees of freedom, and this is the low energy degrees of freedom, right? And this is what I'm integrating out, right? That's a way of saying that I'll do the integral in, in phi hat, and these uh, modes, after I finish my coarse graining and bring my cut off from this point to this one, these modes won't be present anymore in the resulting theory, right? So this, uh, when, I, when, I, when I define things like that, I can just do this replacement, right? Phi going to phi plus phi hat, because the sum of these two will be equivalent to what I had before, right? In fact, this is without the hat, right? That means I go back to this original one, Right? And, uh, and now I can rewrite my z, right? my generating functional, in terms of these two guys. So let me copy this just so we have a reference. And let's uh, paste it down here, just so we can look at it and write the new one. So the new z now, and notice I'm, I'm uh, leaving the, the sources out. You can assume it's here always, right? But uh, it doesn't matter for what we're doing. So the, the integral now is on B lambda for this guy, right? It goes only uh, up to B lambda. But now there's also this other one, 
which is more complicated. It is actually between B lambda and lambda, and that's the momentum shell that we were talking here at the start. Right? If can you can think since we're doing uh, these uh, constraints in the module of k, right? If you think in three-dimensional space for for k vector, these will be spherical shells because I'm I'm just uh, uh, fixing the absolute value of k, right? So this ad integral in k hat is more complicated, right? Uh, and I can now rewrite my action in terms of these two variables. Right? This is pretty straightforward. Right? I'll have half of del mu phi del mu phi hat square plus half of m0 square phi plus phi hat square plus little lambda zero over four factorial phi plus phi hat to the fourth. Right? And this is where the exponential ends. Right? And now what I want to do, so I don't need that anymore, right? What I want to do is to take, you see, there are many terms here like this one, just this, this first uh, derivative square, or this phi square, or this phi to the fourth, which are again the original Lagrangian for phi, but now with a lower cutoff. I want to separate those, right? So I can repeat this integral right here, right? With the exponential of that original Lagrangian. It's exactly the same I had before. I'm suppressing the integrals here are all, always in x, but I don't want to write the, too many integrals here. I won't have the space, so I'm just writing it like that. Right? And now I'm left with this integral here and all the terms that involve phi hat, either just phi hat or some cross terms between phi hat and, and phi. Right? So what do I have here? Let me write the exponential of minus, I'm missing an integral here, d4x half del mu phi hat square plus f m0 square phi hat square plus lambda zero one sixth of phi cube phi hat plus one over four phi square phi hat square plus one over six phi I had cubed plus, and I put on the bottom line here, one over four factorial phi hat to the fourth. This is all proportional to lambda zero. Let me just check the signs. This is a hat, let me make it more clear. That's not more clear. That's better. And now I have to close this one and this one right here. Right? So you might have you might you might uh, be missing some terms here, but the thing is that these uh, since these are a momentum uh, components for different momenta, right? I'm sure the case that are included in these guys are all different from the k that are in this guy. Any term that involves phi, phi linearly like that will be zero because they are orthogonal, right? So any phi, phi hat terms go away, right? 
and that's those are not included here just because of orthogonality now let's see uh, how that works in principle i want to integrate this guy right but that's hard to do in in general right we don't we know how to integrate the gaussian parts of this right but we cannot just integrate everything so i have to do perturbative uh uh, use a, a perturbative approach here. Right? The only thing I'm not including in, in the perturbative approach is this term. Even the mass of this guy, I'll treat this term with M0, I'll treat perturbatively, because that's uh, useful to do in this case. Right? Also, this mass is much smaller than any uh, of the, than the scale that is going around uh, the momentum integration, so I can treat it perturbatively. As far as the kinetic term goes, I can do the integration, right? And get the propagator for this guy, right? So the integration of what I, I can call L0 of phi hat, right? So the free uh, field right? uh, will be given by the d4x of del mu phi hat, del mu phi right and then i can and uh, i can uh, fourier transform these guys right and write these as the integral in d4x times two integrals in k d4k over two pi to the fourth integral in d4k prime over two pi to the fourth exponentials minus i k x exponential minus i k prime x these derivatives just become k mu and k prime mu right and this is phi k prime phi hat of k and this is the same as of course these integrals are all both momentum integrals are in this region be lambda not that it matters too much because we're doing this using the Dirac delta that is here so i can do the integral in x that will become a, a Dirac delta for k equals to min minus k prime right and then I can do the integral in k prime using that Dirac delta, right? Which then gives leaves me with just one momentum integral, d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, right? k square pi hat of minus k, because k prime is minus k because of this, right? And phi of k right and this integral happens for b lambda smaller or equal module of k smaller than lambda right this is the condition for the integration in this moment and you might remember that this is the usual form for a massless uh, because I, i'm treating the mass perturbatively this is essentially uh, what happens for a massless uh, real uh, field but you might remember that uh, if the uh, field in position space right phi of x is real phi of k won't be real and this is actually phi star of k right this this uh, condition for the the Fourier components of this guy is what ensures this guy is real, right? The phi of x is real. Now, from this uh, momentum space uh, Lagrangian for the free propagator, we can calculate the propagator, right? All we have to do is to calculate this contraction. Which is given in terms of a path integral 
by the the expectation value of this operator right phi k phi hat p with this Lagrangian up here normalized to this right And this we know it will just give us the inverse of this operator, right? It's just one over k square, two pi to the fourth, delta four of k plus p, because of this minus k here, right? And I have this function which uh, ensures this range for the momentum. Let me box this expression here, right? And this uh, function here is defined in this way. Just ensures is one if B lambda is between k is between b lambda and lambda and zero otherwise right just outside this region one we'll right again right uh, so this is the propagator for this uh, pi hat field right and now I, I i will treat everything else perturbatively right so i want to take this exponential all the other terms here in the exponential and uh, expand the exponential in a Taylor series and truncate that. So for instance, we'll focus on this term that has phi square, phi hat square, right? Just an uh, example. We will exchange the exponential of this guy phi square, phi hat square, right? Approximately by this. And then we can go as high as we want in this uh, perturbative series by taking extra contributions. Mm -hmm. And then we want to use this to calculate functions in this new theory, right? We're trying to build a theory that is valid in this low energy regime, right? In this region, all the way down here. We're especially interested in what happens down here, right? We want to be far away from any of these cutoffs. Right? and calculate transition amplitudes here, S matrix elements, and you, you name it, right? This will look like this, right? These are the, the kind of things that we could calculate, like phi, phi, exponential of the interaction, Lagrangian, right? This, the Li includes all those terms that we will spend. But I could also think of calculating this thing, right, with phi, hat phi hat exponential of that like that the thing is right i could go on right even have a cross terms between phi and phi hat and but the thing is since i'm only interested in in the really low energy behavior of this right i won't have final states or initial states or final states created by phi hat right nor we will calculate observables that involve the uh, uh, powers of phi hat because phi hat has been integrated out so in general the kind of operators i will calculate will really uh, even the initial and final states or the observables will have to be defined in terms of the field that is still present in the low momentum region, right? And phi hat will only appear inside loops where momentum can go high, right? All the way to lambda, remember? 
I had this upper cut off, so my momentum integration goes all the way to these guys. And in this region, once I go above B lambda, and I'm still below lambda, that, that's where phi hat appears. So this thing will contribute in matrix elements that look like this, right? That's what I'm interested in, right? Then. So try to understand the point. The assumption here is that I'm only calculating matrix elements at low energy. So phi, neither uh, phi, phi hat does not appear neither on the initial and final states. There are no states created by this guy appearing here, nor in, in the observables. Right? Now, if that is true, right, that means that in this, uh, if I think this in terms of Vic, Vic theorem, right, these phi, uh, phi hats can only be contracted uh, with each other because they cannot annihilate initial and final states and there's no phi hats anywhere else. So these guys will have to be contracted and that is a, a calculation I can do, right? I can take these uh, contraction here and and write this is the integral in d4x of lambda 0 over 4 phi square phi hat phi hat right and i can write these two guys in momentum space do the contraction right and the contraction in momentum space will be the propagator right so this will be the same as d for x lambda 0 over 4 phi square right times these two integrals for the Fourier transform of these guys will be say d4 k1 over 2 pi to the fourth exponential of minus i k1 x same thing for a k2 And then phi hat of k1, phi hat of k2, contracted, right? And this is the propagator, so I can substitute it for the propagator, which is 1 over k1 square delta 4 k1 plus k2 times that function I defined up there that just ensures k1 is between uh, B lambda and lambda, right? And that I can use to integrate in one of these uh, momentum, one of these momenta, right? And just write these as minus, let me just repeat this part, right? And then I have this integral. I actually forget a 2 pi to the fourth here that concealed this one. So the propagator had also a 2 pi to the fourth in the numerator. Right? These I'll just call k. You can remove that label. k1 is minus k2. I can use that here. right? And that's 1 over k square. Right? So um, now I would name this thing, I would define a quantity called mu. It's not the same mu we have seen before, right? This is just new mu. It has dimensions of mass if you do dimensional analysis here. Oh, this guy will be lambda zero over two. I'm leaving an extra two here, right, integral in d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, 1 over k square, and um, 
this this integral I can do. This is just right. We did this, this integrals before, and remember this is now a finite integral, right? Because k is only between b lambda and lambda. Right? There's an angular part, and we are in Euclidean space, so this is I can put this in spherical coordinates, and and then there will be a, a integral in k here with the module of k, which will give me k square, right? So it's lambda zero. Two pi, two times four pi square, one minus b square, lambda square, right? The upper limit is just lambda square, and the lower limit is b square lambda square, right? Because the the integral will be on a linear, with just the integral of k, right? For the module, and then if I go back to that, remember, notice I left a minus one outside. Actually, this exponential shouldn't be here, sorry. Because k1 is minus k2, so the exponential goes away. This is just 1 over k squared, that's why it's not appearing here. So, I left an extra factor of minus half here. Right? And that means I can take this matrix element and rewrite it here. like that. This I just repeat. And in here I have minus half, right? The extra power of 2 here. So minus mu over 2. And then I have uh, phi square here. So the thing I want you to notice, right, is that once I have integrated out phi hat, right? You see phi hat went away, right? Since it's only appearing in loops, I can solve for the contribution of the loop. This is a finite loop now, right? So it's just this number, right? And then I have a matrix element, which is the same. Uh, I can calculate the expectation value of this operator now as if I had this extra new term here, let me color this one, in the Lagrangian for phi. So you see, integrating in phi hat gave me a new effective term for the Lagrangian of phi. Of course, this is just the first part of it. I would also need the whole Taylor series, right? So I can read some and, and make these into the exponential of these, and that, that's what goes into uh, the Lagrangian for phi. But we'll see pretty soon that all the other terms, like this uh, term square and cubed, and, uh, they all appear too, right? In fact, we'll do that using Feynman diagrams, right? So I, now what I want to do is define a diagrammatic expansion for these theory that involves phi and phi hat. So I'll use a double line to indicate the phi hat propagator. And for instance, this uh, uh, interaction that we saw here with lambda square and phi hat square will give me a vertex that looks like that, right? There's two phi's and two phi hats meeting at a point, right? Straight away, you can see where a good part of the expansion for this guy will come from, right? If you calculate, say, the full propagator for phi, which is this object right here, phi of x1, phi of x2, omega, right? This will contain a lot of stuff. We have seen loops and 1PI diagrams and whatnot. But now that we have this possibility, right, this will have, amongst other things, right, a diagram that looks like this. Right? This is exactly this one with uh, the two propagators uh, right here. Right? So this is just 
minus um, minus mu over two phi square, right? It's coming from from there, and and but we also have, of course, other terms, right? That look like this, right? So now I'm guaranteed to have these and these, which we know uh, what they they lead to, right? I can resum a whole series of diagrams like that, amongst many others that come from other interactions in the theory. But this one is sure to throw this mu here, which I defined badly, right? I should have called it mu square, but it's too late for that. Uh, this mu will sure to be some with them as in the denominator of the full propagator for this guy. So you can see how this really is contributing to all orders and I can integrate all these small loops here and get, again, finite contributions because this guy just cannot go uh, uh, to any momentum, right? Just bounded between B lambda and lambda, right? Say we go to order uh, lambda zero square now. Right? So I have two insertions of these uh, vertex, right? And I look at the four point function. So now I'm thinking of calculating uh, some expectation value of this, right? Four point function needs to be four phi's because phi, da, phi hat is only appearing in loops, right? Here I'll have many contributions again, but one of them is sure to be this one. Let me get that line there, which is a disconnected uh, contribution. So this one, whoops, this one doesn't bring anything new. It just doesn't generate any uh, propagator, any any real contribution to a four uh, phi interaction, but just the product of of two. Uh, a complete propagator, right? So those don't matter. Those disconnected diagrams don't matter much, right? They will not generate anything that is not here already. But there is a new one, which is really now this guy. A vertex here, a vertex there. And this thing right here. So a double line in the middle. Okay. And so let's think about this guy, right? Now, um, what I have is two insertions of phi hat here, right? So I have phi to the fourth, phi hat to the fourth in here. The phi's will be contracted with the external states and the phi hats will be contract amongst themselves. Right, so this will be equivalent once I integrate. Right, this will be equivalent. So this part here will be equivalent to a new term in the Lagrangian for phi, which is proportional to phi to the fourth, right, times some constants. Let me call that zeta. One over four factorial, just because this looks a lot a lot like a lambda phi four interaction, right? But now zeta is given by this integral right here, which I can write actually. Right? So zeta in this case will be given by that's a definition. Let me color it properly. So this minus one. Or factorial I forced, so I have to put it here again. Right? It just is in the definition of zeta. Now I have a factor two in the numerator because there's four phi hats 
for these uh, insertion, right? And I can contract them in two ways, right? So that's a factor two. This two factorial here is just because I'm in the second order in the Taylor expansions of the exponential for that interaction, this interaction, right? This one, I'm, I'm taking it twice now, so I'm in the second order of the Taylor expansion. And then just uh, the interaction itself, which is lambda zero over four square. And then there's an integral in this momentum, right? And again, since the momentum involved in these double lines, which are the phi hat momentum, are much bigger than anything that can run to phi because this is scattering is happening at low energy. I can forget this external moment inside the loop. They are always uh, much smaller than the momentum in the loop. That's different from before, right? Because the momentum in the loop could before could go all the way near zero. Now it can't. It's at most at the lower limit equal to b lambda, which is still much higher than the external momenta here. So now I can simplify my life a lot. This is just an integral in k, right? To pi to the fourth. And this is where I'm integrating. And then there's two propagators there, both with the same momentum. I know how to do this integral. Now I have k to the fourth in the denominator. That means the, the answer will be a log, right? So these the, just uh, simplifying all these factors in front will be a three lambda zero square over two, right? This is just all of these. Now this two pi to the fourth, there's a, a solid angle integration here, right? That gives me one over two cubed pi square, right? was a two pi uh, square in the numerator, right? and then the log within those limits. Right? Remember, don't confuse this lambda which, with what we had before. This is a finite number now. Right? There's, it's not going to infinity at the end of the calculation. It's like really a finite uh, physical cutoff. Right? Goes away in this case. And I get just 3 the 0 square over 16 pi square log of 1 over b. Okay. So what one convenient way of writing this, because it makes it easier to compare with the loops we did before, is to put a 32 here and put a b square here. Right. Uh, remember when I, we did this before, this kind of loop, we always had a momentum square in here, right? We decided to show it like that, right? Many times. And, and so we get exactly this expression in many, many times before, but then we had to take the limit of something inside the log going to a singularity, and now we don't, right? So uh, you could think, you can see what is happening here, right? We could. Uh, go to other interactions. So this guy clearly has other counterparts here. Let me copy it just to have the double line. But if you look at the Lagrangian for phi and phi hat, there's clearly other interactions there, right? So I have this guy right here, right? But uh, for instance, this guy will be something like uh, three pi's and one phi hat. This other one is the opposite, right? There's three phi hats and, and one pi. Right? And this is uh, phi hat to the fourth, right? It's just this guy like that. Right? I can use all those interactions to uh, to calculate uh, what happens, but you can see I'm generating a bunch of operators. Right? 
In fact, I could do that again and again, and it is important to notice some regularity here, right? So the contribution for this uh, momentum uh, shell is exactly the log of 1 over b here, right? Proportional to the log of 1 over b. Now, if I do other uh, slices, say, oop, I'm still have, uh, I still have the double line here. Let's suppose I, I, I do that again. Right? So this is modulus of k. I started from lambda and I, I went to b lambda. And, and close to this place, is where I actually doing my physics. It's not really zero, right? Because my uh, field lambda has a mass. So really, if in order to see uh, field lambda, field phi, right? My field phi has a mass. So in order to see phi particles, I have to be around where I can produce these particles. So the lower end scale is really the mass of this particle. So I could do that again. I could introduce another factor, say C, that is multiplying B lambda. C is also smaller than one. And I could go with a D, right? C, B, lambda, right? All of these numbers, B, C, and D, are smaller than one. No? The point is that the contribution is always the log of this thing, right? The difference, the contribution, the integral from here to here will eliminate now B lambda and will be the log of 1 over C and then the log of 1 over D, right? So for each uh, multiplicative interval, I get a correction proportional to the log of that interval. So I could take like this, uh, to, to, for instance, just to, to get a feeling, right? I could take D equals C equal B equal 0 0.1. That means I'm, I'm lowering my cutoff by one order of magnitude at each slice. That will give me a constant contribution. For each lowering of the cutoff, of one order of magnitude, I get exactly the same number here, here, and here. Right? That's important because you can see, eventually, of course, we'll relate this uh, change in the constants that is happening here to the running. And you see that the running happens in relation to the log of, of momentum, right? And that's, that's the origin of it. And the fact that we're dealing with a field theory that now only has uh, finite loops is a pleasure in itself, right? And you see, uh, it was not that hard to obtain. Uh, now, these interactions do not only generate, already we saw that by considering the loops, right? We found a correction to phi 2 and a correction to phi 4, right? Uh, respectively, uh, mu and, and zeta, right? But that's not all. Right? Take, for instance, uh, one of the interactions that we talked about, the one that is uh, given by phi cubed uh, phi hat, right? which had uh, this uh, form right here, right? Something like that. This guy also generates, even at three level, new uh, contributions. See, I could take this diagram, right? And plug another three lines on, on this other side. So this is proportional to this. This is also proportional to lambda zero. So at order lambda zero square, I get this contribution, which is given, it's proportional, right? Uh, to lambda zero square over p1 plus p2 plus p3 square where p1 p2 p3 are, are the momenta going in on this side 
of course, times the function that comes with the propagator for the double line, saying that P1 plus P2 plus P3 needs to hit above uh, the cutoff for the low energy theory, right? The thing is that this is equivalent to a phi 6 uh, operator, and of course, I can also find loops that will contribute to phi 6. So I'll, I'll also generate phi 6, phi 8, phi 10. And not even that is all. If you consider that at some point when we were calculating this guy. So that's one of the, the things we calculate. I disregarded the external uh, momentum, right? And that allowed me to write this term right here. D for X, Zeta, oops, Phi 4, right? But that's a pretty drastic uh, assumption that I can just forget about this external momentum. What I could do that is a little better than that is do uh, is is to do a Taylor series in the external moment, and that means I would have another term that is given by minus one over four for again uh, d four x. Let's call this eta, right? Phi square del mi phi square. Now I have two powers of the, these four external uh, momenta. And I could go on, right? I could take even terms that have higher powers of the external momenta. That, that, that turns into a series of operators that, that involve all powers of the fields and all powers of the derivatives of the fields. I can generate a whole bunch of operators just by integrating out this guy right here. You can even try some combinations and see what operators you get, right? The, the bottom line is that everything that is not allowed, not, not forbidden by some symmetry in the original Lagrangian, will be allowed here. So you can write an infinite number of operators, right? And once I exponentiate all of that, I finally get uh, what I wanted from the start, which is now a, a new generating functional right, with, with its normalization. And that's where all the disconnected diagrams go, right? Some of them will just become uh, repetitions of like the full propagator or or, but the, the fully disconnected diagrams, the one that do, do not connect to any external line, those became, become vacuum bubbles that disappear when I take this normalization into consideration. And the rest of the path integral now goes only to be lambda, right? And I can do C, D, and do that again and again, but I have a different uh, Lagrangian here which I'll call an effective Lagrangian, obtained by the integration out or out integration of phi hat, right? Let me write some expression for this uh, effective Lagrangian. It won't be, I mean, a rigorous expression, just a pictorial thing. Effective will be half del mu phi square plus half m0 square phi square 1 over 4 dagger lambda 0 phi to the fourth plus all connected because they need to be connected to some external phi line otherwise they go away connected phi hat contributions, right? And this is my new Lagrangian. 
Now, that's okay, right? We, we have seen that we can do, at least in the case of a scalar field in, in Euclidean space, we can do this coarse graining, right? Of course, this will be much more complicated if we talk about gauge fields in Minkowski space, right? That's why this Wilsonian approach is, is, is it's very hard to use for uh, more complicated theories because of, of these hard cutoff that you put in as you integrate, breaks a lot of war, Takahashi identities. Okay? But the idea has to, to be uh, true, at least in some sense, right? That you're getting rid of these microscopic degrees of freedom. Now, the important thing, and this is really important, Right? It's now that I have two ways of calculating the same thing. Right? So I have my original Lagrangian, right? That was valid up to this physical cutoff and involved actually just two parameters, just m0 squared and lambda zero, right? And I can use that to calculate cross sections, right? So any cross section. And that I can check with experiments. Right? So I can go into my experiment, measure events, right? Rate, rate of events that connect to the cross section. Uh, and I can plot that in terms of some uh, combination of the external momentum, the moment, the initial and the final momentum, right? And there is a point here that I can measure. I just take a combination of these guys and measure my cross section at that point. If I do that for many points, I get some curve here that tells me what the cross section is. Right? Now I can do that again. Now I use the effective Lagrangian, which has a lower cutoff, B lambda, but has different parameters. So M0 will receive a contribution of mu. That's why I should have called this guy mu square. Right? I get lambda zero, getting a new contribution from what I call zeta, right? I have even other operators, right? Everything that I can draw that leads to the particular cross section I'm calculating uh, will go in, right? And I can use that to calculate the cross section, right? But if I'm doing my measurements way below lambda, and way below B lambda, so I'm low energy, uh, doing this experiment at low energies, this, the result of the experiment, needs to be the same, right? I just change the color of my curve, but th this is really important, right? I'm just changing the description. The physics cannot change at low energy. Right? These are the same theories, right? To go from here to here, all I did is remove some, some degrees of freedom and rewrote, rewrite my Lagrangian in terms of other degrees of freedom, but they are this, they encapsulate the same physics, right? And now you see why these parameters need to change, right? Because when I'm calculating this cross-section, all loop integrals will be done up to lambda. Oh, in here, all loop integrals will be done up to B lambda. So I changed part of my calculation. Something else needs to change to compensate and give the same sigma. Otherwise, uh, there's no way, right? I, I'm, I'm doing uh, different integrals. So I need to compensate that in the values of the couplings. Otherwise, I would never get the same sigma on both sides. And that's what the running of these couplings with these internal parameters. Keep in mind, I'm not talking about the running in terms of the external moment. I'm talking about this dependency of the couplings on these internal parameters, right? That's where it comes from. You need to vary it to compensate for the fact that you're changing these parameters somewhere else in our calculation. In this case, 
of the Wilsonian approach, you're change, changing the cutoff, right? By doing this coarse graining, right? So that's the me, the memo for the day, right? Uh, we can right away understand why our coupling constants need to depend on this cutoff, right? Even if the cutoff shouldn't appear in the final experimental observables. Okay? So see you on the next video.